the color of our skin will always identify us. If you came in from any European background, once you took the job down here and moved up through the ranks, nobody paid any attention because the color of your skin did not identify you in any other way. It didn't hamper you. But that is not true with us. If they had been white, the story of Toledo's first African Americans would not have been far different than that of the city's Poles, or Irish, or Germans. They came here fleeing oppression, poverty, seeking a new start, land to call their own, freedom. They built homes, schools, shops. They worked and prayed, did what they could to give their children a hand up. But they weren't white, these fugitive slaves from the cotton states. So their story is different in its unfolding and in its beginning. They came to Toledo, many of them, at night, in secret, less concerned with their prospects here than with the misery that they fled. The road they followed was perilous and lonely. Uh, when we think of the underground movement, we typically think of this organized system where people are going to be conducting and leading you from station to station. And in Ohio, we have a pretty good underground railroad movement. It's not as organized as one would think. It's sort of like a loose network of sites. However, if you are a slave in the Deep South, you're in Alabama, there are no whites in Alabama. They're probably going to help you. So you're going to leave on your own. And I think that's something that we miss in the history of the Underground Railroad, is that the majority of those who are escaping were on their own. They empowered themselves. They took no help from anyone. The slaves were active participants. They were major players in this story. They shouldn't be just in the background as passengers. These were the people who had the guts and the uh, ability to escape and to uh, do something that was quite remarkable and in a sense to weaken slavery in so doing. The fugitives risked beating, maiming, even death if they were caught. But they kept on. Ohio's southern hills concealed them, speeding their passage. But when they reached the edges of Northwest Ohio's great black swamp, the slaves must have wondered if they had run into worse trouble than they had left behind. The largest mosquitoes ever lived were in the black swamp. and. What they brought with them, of course, was the ague or malaria. And a person caught out in the swamp at night was in terrific danger. There were wild animals. There were poisonous snakes. There was quicksand, narrow trails, uh, animal trails, places that the first settlers said you walked through the mud because there was nowhere else to step. The trail was that bad. As fetid and dangerous as it was, the swamp proved to be a refuge. It turned away pursuers. Its inhabitants, Native American tribes, provided food, clothing, and passage out of the swamp. Perrysburg marked a fork in the road north. The fugitives who chose to press on followed the Maumee River to the lake and booked passage on ships or crossed winter ice to Canada. Others skirted the swamp into Sylvania and southeastern Michigan, making their way across the Detroit River to Windsor. But for many, this was far enough. With the black swamp and countless miles behind them, they felt safe enough to settle in Northwest Ohio. They found a makeshift community of free blacks and fugitive slaves near downtown Toledo. 
its settlers organized the city's first black church in 1861 with help from local abolitionists James Ashley and Richard Mott. They rented a building on the corner of Summit and Adams Streets. Three years later, the congregation moved into larger quarters at 15 Erie Street. The church became known as Warren Chapel and later Warren African Methodist Episcopal Church. Warren wasn't the only church for African Americans. Some attended First Baptist, an integrated church on Huron near Cherry, until they could form a congregation of their own. Third Baptist was started by two persons, laymen, who in 1868 or, or thereabouts decided that they wanted to pull out from First Baptist Church and start a church of their own race. And so they petitioned the church to dismiss them so that they could do this. And of course, the church accepted it and uh, eventually released them from membership. And later on, they helped them to get started in their own church. Church was the first route these early African Americans put down here. Education would be the next. Although some attended Toledo's public schools, as long as white parents did not object, the city's schools generally excluded black children. Concerned, a group of blacks and whites formed the Toledo Colored School Association. They opened a school just for African American children in the former Lucas County Courthouse in 1862. The building was poorly appointed, but it served until pressure from Toledo's black community persuaded the school board to desegregate city schools in 1871. As the Civil War ended, Toledo's black community was establishing itself, like many of the city's other ethnic groups. While in the South, those they had left behind faced an uprooting that would force them north in a new wave of migration. Slavery ended officially in 1865 with the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, written and sponsored by Toledo Congressman James Ashley. But things didn't change much for Southern blacks. Reconstruction replaced slavery with sharecropping, bondage with crushing poverty. The plantation owner would provide the, the land and the seed and fertilizer and everything that the uh, tenant farmer needed to farm the land. And at the end of the year, they were to divide up the profits. Theoretically, that was a fairly sound way of doing it uh, when there was no money available. The landholder had all of the property, had all of the resources, and um, uh, advance money or advance goods in order for the uh, tenant farmer to live throughout the year. Uh, unfortunately, over the years, um, the uh, landed gentry began to cheat the uh, tenant farmer, and the more the uh, farmer worked, the more he became in debt. So as a consequence, uh, many of them felt like they needed to move to the north where there were other opportunities. Social and economic pressures pushed more African Americans out of the South. The promise of factory jobs pulled them north. A wave of migration crashed upon Toledo as thousands of African Americans came to seek a new start. People living in the um, Deep South, in Alabama, Mississippi, um, even Tennessee, tended to migrate in the cities of the Midwest um, Columbus, uh, Toledo, Cleveland, uh, Detroit, and Chicago. The first uh, migrants to those cities uh, tended to draw people from their own communities. So families followed families, friends followed friends, and a congregation followed congregations. And they developed many communities uh, in these uh, urban areas in which they could uh, support each other, uh, reinforce each other, and provide basic services. They came north to find work, but they discovered they weren't the only ones. Blacks and European immigrants vied for the same positions, and the competition was fierce. Both groups started at the bottom of the ladder, taking whatever work they could get. But the jobs that were stepping stones for Europeans 
became millstones for Toledo's blacks. Blacks were generally relegated to the lowest paying jobs, uh, menial jobs, uh, janitorial jobs, and those in industries that uh, were the dirtiest jobs. But even those jobs, uh, they found competition from uh, people like the Irish who uh, came in and were willing to uh, work those jobs until they worked themselves up. That changed, at least temporarily, when war in Europe stoked the fires of American factories while denying them their traditional workforce. There was a demand for more manufactured goods even prior to the United States' entrance into World War I. Uh, so industry had met those needs previously with immigrants, but now you have immigration bans in 1914, so where are you going to get a labor force? So industry decided to go down south. Toledo's African-American population exploded. Migrating southern blacks settled wherever they could, in small pockets all over the city. Ironwood near the rail yards in East Toledo, Stickney Avenue in the north, and more than anywhere else, in the city's traditional cradle of immigrant neighborhoods. Eventually, by about 1920, uh, one area was encompassing uh, virtually all the blacks in the city, centering around the Lynx Hill area. It was on the edge of the Irish neighborhood earlier, but it had been primarily a German neighborhood, and Germans moved out as blacks moved in. We pledge support towards the ridding of the community of undesirable characters, especially colored people, and we refuse to rent or sell property to them. Everyone realizes that the presence of colored families causes property to depreciate in value. We believe that every self-respecting colored person will take advantage of this opportunity to find a home elsewhere among those who do not object to their presence. They found that there were housing covenants where people would not sell to them because of their race. They found out that there was creative financing in the sense that if you wanted to uh, finance a house in a quote unquote white area, if the house cost $20,000, you were told you couldn't get it. If you wanted to finance a house in the black area and it cost $25,000 by the same bank, you were told you could get it. Community housing agreements and discriminatory banking practices were illegal, but they persisted, and they shaped the way Toledo's African Americans would live for decades. As the Irish and Germans left the neighborhoods around Pinewood and Indiana Avenues, the area became the core of Toledo's black community, and at the heart of those neighborhoods were the churches. The black church uh, was practically everything to black people um, outside the family. You, you had the family and then uh, there was the church. By the late 20s, Toledo's black community had erected churches of practically every denomination. They were a prominent symbol of independence, inspiring pride and ownership during a time when blacks had little else to call their own. I think uh, one of the most important things to remember about the black church historically is that it was owned by, by black people. Other than the family, it was practically the only institution that black people had which they could call their own. And, and that's because they were the ones who financed the church. They generally selected their ministers. They had responsibility for administration of the church, uh, for fundraising, for scheduling of programs and services. And so they often enjoyed saying, this is our church. Toledo's black churches were more than just places to worship. They were the center of African-American life, providing opportunities for education, recreation, even romance. Our church always had our Sunday school in the morning, and, and it's a block, a little better than a block from Third Baptist Church. Well, Third Baptist Church had a big Sunday school, and they had a lot of young men going there. So all the girls and boys would go there. So I asked my mother, was it possible that I could go sometime? She said, well, after you go to your own church, I don't care if you want to go to church. So I used to go, after my church was out, go down there. And then we'd go to Sunday school and meet the boys and so forth. But, and that's where I met my husband. <laughs> he went there and I met him. Churches solidify the African-American community, congregation by congregation. Collectively, they wielded political and economic power, 
enough to affect social change at a time when individual blacks could not. I can remember my grandfather telling me of a white-owned uh, store, a rather large store within the black community that uh, did not have uh, black folk working there. Representative from NAACP and clergy uh, met with the man and indicated what they wanted. And he indicated that that was his practice and he wasn't going to change it. And so the religious community came together and they established a boycott. Walked around that store and no one went into it. Some folks that went into it as they came out of the store and passed a little alleyway, there was a little serious discussion about the fact that they shouldn't do that again. It wasn't too many weeks before that store owner on a Sunday sent word to the minister that he was ready to sit down and negotiate, to which there was a reply that this is the Sabbath. I don't do business. The following Monday, the hiring pattern was changed. World War I had sent Toledo's blacks to fight in countries they'd never seen. Some found better treatment in Europe and stayed. Those that returned faced uncertain times. While white soldiers resumed their pre-war careers, black veterans found that the jobs the war had created were gone. Without the attraction of guaranteed employment in the North, Southern migration slowed. Toledo's black community turned inward to care for its own, and new black leaders and organizations emerged to serve the city's African Americans. Attorney Albertus Brown organized the local chapter of the NAACP in 1915. Brown also founded the Frederick Douglass Community Association. It was Toledo's first recreational center exclusively for blacks. The Douglas Center was more than a gymnasium. It was a meeting place for clubs and groups, a school for adults, and a venue for concerts and speakers. By 1930, more than 10,000 African Americans lived in Northwest Ohio, and the Douglas Center could not meet all their needs. So a group of black professionals led by Reverend B. F. McWilliams of Third Baptist Church solicited support to build a YMCA for area blacks. Toledo Blade publisher Paul Block championed the project. He gave money and put the weight of his newspaper behind the plan to build the Indiana Y. Almost everything that happened in the community happened out of that facility. There was a uh, black businessmen's group. It met there. There sometimes were fledgling churches that had their beginnings there. And of course, there was the programming for the youngsters in that facility, and many of us were there practically the whole day. They had a swimming pool, they had a gym, they had club meeting rooms, uh, they had very civic activities. It was an integral part of the community. Thousands of children who are now outstanding adults in our city filtered through that YMCA. It epitomized what community is truly all about uh, in terms of the caring, the nurturing, the mentoring, the commitment that is so essential for us. The Indiana Y gave African American children some of the same opportunities white kids had enjoyed for years. But the fact that the city needed a segregated branch of a Christian organization was a nagging symptom of Toledo's lingering struggle with tolerance. It was a segregated institution, not by the Indiana Avenue Wise uh, desire, but from the segregation uh, that existed at that time. And even the panel of the light switches was segregated. On the back of the panel, it had the colored YMCA. So we used some terms then that uh, uh, were accepted and uh, uh, it was a way of life, but when we look back at the YMCA as it existed at that time, the Indiana Avenue YMCA, it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. Many of Toledo's businesses were also off limits to African Americans. 
especially restaurants and hotels. Since white-owned establishments would not serve them, African Americans opened their own, creating a parallel society to meet their needs. Their small shops initially popped up throughout the black community, but over the years, their owners moved closer and closer to a black business district centered on Door Street. We had that geographic identification, not only in terms of where we lived, in terms of the housing, but also in terms of the emerging uh, black-owned businesses uh, where there was a great deal of activity. Everything was there. The restaurants, the barber shops, the service stations, the clothing stores. You could spend your life in that community and never leave it. And in the memories of many residents, one neighborhood store stands out as Black Toledo's most popular meeting place, Stewart's Pharmacy, on the corner of Indiana and City Park. Stewart's was a gathering point, the soda fountain. You know, you were not going to these white ones. So they all gathered at Stewart's. We had the old-fashioned cases that were covered with the glass, you know, where the, where the medications were, you know, over-the-counter medications and all like that. And we had the magazine rack and the candy counter. And I can remember on Saturday nights, we would pan-pack this ice cream, you know, because Sunday morning, the people were coming in to get their newspapers and their ice cream. And they wanted hand-packed. I'd be willing to bet you we'd have 100 quarts of hand-packed ice cream in the freezer for these people. Because if you can, you know, like maybe five or six of them come in there at the same time and they all want a quarter ice cream, so you got to pack it. No, no, we packed that Saturday night. Ella P. Stewart ran the pharmacy with her husband, William. Everyone called him Doc. The Stewarts were proud of their community and the people who lived there. They made the pharmacy a place of opportunity for them. The people who worked in there were obviously college trained or students who were on their way in that path. And so you had a feeling of people who, who had upward mobility, people who would give you advice, people who were encouraging you, that kind of thing. I started there in my last year of, of high school and then I worked all the way through college. Most of the people they lived in that neighborhood or came into the drugstore, thought they were my parents. We had that type of relationship. And like the other day, I went to the banker's uh, reception. And I met past this fellow, and he called me Mr. St Hi, Mr. Stewart, which meant that I knew him. He knew me years and years and years ago. I still meet people that call me Mr. Stewart. Through the 1930s, Stewart's Pharmacy buttressed the community against the weight of the Great Depression. It hit Toledo hard, and the city's blacks even harder. People talk to the pharmacists, you know, they're waiting for um, their prescription to be filled, and they start chatting about problems, and they can't get a house, they can't find a place to live. Uh, and especially into the 30s with the combination of the Depression and migration of more African Americans in the community, Ella found herself trying to see what other um, agencies were available in the town to try to help these people that were coming to the pharmacy. And so she became known to city officials and the two kind of just um, gelled in that way. She was a joiner. She was a very active person. Ella Stewart, pharmacist, became Ella Stewart, activist. She joined local women's groups and eventually became president of both the Ohio and National Associations of Colored Women, and later worked internationally as a goodwill ambassador for the United Nations. She was the type of woman that just kind of lived her life how she thought it should be lived and tried to act out what she thought were her goals in life. And I think she was very pleased with the recognition that she received, but she did them not for that glory. She did them because that was her life. That's how she needed to live her life. 
As the depression deepened, bank failures and massive unemployment paralyzed Toledo. The city's African Americans found it virtually impossible to find work. Many major employers would not hire blacks. Others gave them only the most menial jobs. Then came the Works Progress Administration. The program meant work for anyone, regardless of color. Black WPA workers took the job to feed their families. In the process, they helped build projects including the Toledo Zoo, the Anthony Wayne Trail, and the Brand Whitlock Homes. Brand Whitlock was one of the country's first housing projects built specifically for African Americans. Its construction began with the demolition of Toledo's oldest neighborhood. The Tenderloin District near downtown had housed Irish Canal and railroad workers more than 50 years earlier. The WPA knocked down its dilapidated homes and replaced them with sparkling new apartments, the envy of the city and a magnet for Toledo's up-and-coming African Americans. That was the place that most progressive people lived. Everybody who was upward mobile, you were in these beautiful new apartments with brand new kitchens, bathrooms, and all of the fixtures and everything, and people were very anxious to live there. But social status alone would not guarantee a spot in the brand Whitlock homes. Applicants first had to pass the project manager's special screening process. Housekeeping standards were maintained and Ms. McWilliams did not play. Mrs. McWilliams was the wife of Dr. McWilliams who was the, uh, the minister of Third Baptist Church. If you were going to be a new tenant, she, walked, she unannounced might show up at your house. And if your housekeeping behavior, let us say, was not up to par, chances are you weren't coming in there. As the 1930s drew to a close, World War II plunged Europe into darkness. Ironically, the war meant better times for Toledoans. The American defense industry stirred again, creating new jobs. Soon, a booming national economy pulled millions of African Americans northward in search of jobs in the city. After World War II, what's happening is that uh, you're getting a real shift in the, in the population. First of all, you're seeing African Americans moving out of rural areas into urban centers in the South, and then leaving both the urban areas and the rural areas going north. For the first time in the history of this country, there were more African Americans living outside of the South than living in the South. The busy streets of Toledo were a long way from the fields of the Deep South. Many new arrivals hesitated to abandon the rural lifestyle entirely, but they found they could have the best of both worlds, a job in the city and a home in the country, just west of Toledo in Spencer Sharples Township. Back in the Depression, an old gentleman named Lawrence Hallett would sell property to African Americans when almost no one else would. And uh, he, he took a lot of heat for, it, for that in, in Swanton, a lot of his neighbors saying he shouldn't be breaking this apartheid rule, but he said they, that he was happy to do it, that they, were, they made their mortgage payments, and that they were welcome to the Spencer Sharples Township. So there was a whole black community out there in the rural area by where the airport is. They could uh, raise a small crop, have sweet corn, have their tomatoes, uh, and drive in to work or drive into play. The nights were alive in post-war Toledo. The city's hotspots beckoned, but held would-be black patrons at a distance until Ella P. Stewart went to work desegregating local theaters. Sometimes Ella would like to go to the movies. Uh, her husband wasn't into them, so she would go to the movies on an afternoon matinee or in the evening. And the first time she did this in Toledo, she was seated taken to the balcony and she said no I don't like to sit here I like to sit down closer to the screen and they said no you have to sit in the balcony and so she and this was how she did things she didn't argue with the usher she said please take me to the manager and she made it clear in her discussions with the manager that um, she uh, was a professional woman that she owned the Stewart pharmacy with her husband a lot of business was being done there and that she would like to sit where she wanted to. 
and he allowed her to do that realizing that that didn't change discrimination in that movie theater she made sure she told all the young people and everybody uh, that she knew that if they went to this particular theater to say that they were the nephews or nieces or cousins or aunts or whomever of Ella P. Stewart and so more and more came and sat where they wanted to and pretty soon in that way uh, discrimination ended in the movie theaters in Toledo. But when the struggle for integration became exhausting and Toledo's blacks just wanted to go out and have a good time, they had plenty of choices besides the movies. Nightclubs like Tate's, Sing Sensation, and the Bellman and Waiters Club. National acts like Dizzy Gillespie often played Toledo concerts at the Tropicana on Madison and the Civic Auditorium on Erie Street. But for down-home rhythm and blues, there was just one place to go, Heinz Farm. Yes, I forgot about Heinz. It was just a big celebration, a lot of folk, a lot of music, and people drinking a lot of beer. Dancing. And, and dancing, you know, everybody having a good time. It was the Afro-American Country Club. Uh, main bands were out there. They had skeet shooting. They had uh, motorcycle uh, races out there. Uh, and of course they had a dance area and a picnic area. Earlier they, the basement of one of the houses was where they had the activities. Later they built a hotel and a dance hall out there and um, it was very popular. The biggest names in black entertainment made the trip to Spencer Sharples Township to play at Heinz Farm. Oh yeah, you had the big guys coming in. Like at the Heinz Farm, they had like B.B. King coming through there. You had the, uh, uh, Abbott and Lil Esther Phillips, Freddie King, Zuma McGregor. We the band open up for Most of the uh, big bands would hang out at Heinz Farm. It was always like a homecoming. You could meet all of your friends out at Heinz Farm. Well-known musicians like the Griswolds were as popular for being hometown folks as for their musical talents. Black Toledo nurtured local artists and musicians, and the community produced two of the country's best, sculptor Lamaxi Glover and pianist Art Tatum. Glover graduated from Libby High School. He worked on the railroad for 25 years before going back to school to study art. He graduated from the University of Toledo and the Cranbrook Academy. Critics loved his sculpture, but Glover declined lucrative offers from several universities. He wanted to share his gifts closer to home, so he taught art at Woodward and Scott High Schools. Glover's sculpture can be seen in galleries and private collections nationwide, but his real legacy lives on in his former students. Art Tatum was born in Toledo in 1910 he was partially blind and a musical prodigy. He played violin and guitar, but it was at the piano that his genius blossomed. In 1932, Tatum signed on to tour with vaudeville singer Adelaide Hall. His career took off, and he performed all over the United States and Europe. Art's prowess at the keyboard fascinated and intimidated other accomplished pianists, and his ability to improvise complex harmonies and play so incredibly quickly inspired jazz scholars to proclaim him the most technically brilliant pianist in history. Toledoans, white and black, may have first heard Art Tatum on WSPD radio. It wasn't unusual to hear talented African-Americans on the air as entertainers. It was another thing entirely, though, to hear a black announcer. Porter Roberts was the first. He hosted a jazz music program for WTOD in the mid-40s, but it was Jean Overton who would become Black Toledo's first lady of radio. My program was primarily rhythm and blues. We started at WTOD in May 
by September, the program had gained so much popularity, I received an offer from WSPD that I couldn't refuse. At WTOD, the show was called Listening with Lady J. And because the, it had become popular, WTOD would not uh, allow me to take the Lady J name with me. So when I went to WSPD, uh, the show was called Rhythm Review. When Overton made the leap to the competition, WTOD scrambled to find a replacement Lady J. They placed an ad in the local paper and received an immediate response. Fran Belcher and her husband owned a newspaper called The Bronze Raven. Uh, when I notified um, TOD that I was going to uh, move to WSPD, then they called The Bronze Raven to run an ad for a replacement for me. And of course, Fran um, decided that she would uh, be the replacement. So, uh, since the show was called Listing with Lady J, uh, she changed it to Lady B. Once she hit the air, Lady B became an official media mogul. Now a radio star, she also owned the paper for Toledo's black community. Everything that went on in the community, you know, whether it was in the church or the clubs or the, the organizations and what have you, was listed in that paper. You know, if you're going to have something, they you call the Bronze Raven out just as you call the journal today. After World War II, the stories of Toledo's European immigrants and its African Americans began to diverge. Soldiers who went to war as Polish Americans or German Americans came home as just plain Americans. Their service seemed to complete their assimilation. They moved out of the old ethnic neighborhoods to new homes in the suburbs communities where blacks were not welcome. When African Americans began moving into the neighborhoods vacated by the Poles and Germans, they saw white neighbors respond by selling their homes and moving out. Uh, typically, black persons knew that when you moved into a neighborhood where we weren't already, you expected within days signs to just sprout up. Uh, all over the, the block and the, the immediate neighborhood uh, because it was kind of an unwritten code that that now is, will be our block and that you're supposed to move. The post-war boom meant good jobs for many African Americans and enough money to buy homes almost anywhere in the city. But they found that having money and having the opportunity were often two different things. The houses that I looked at in the Old West End, I went in by night. Meaning that if a home was being sold, they were not interested in having the neighbors see that they were possibly interested in selling it to a minority, to a black person. Real estate uh, persons uh, were orchestrating how the city <laughs> was uh, changing. And you had to buy in the neighborhoods that were um, open to you uh, it was a practice called redlining where they just uh, outlined the block almost literally not only the neighborhood the blocks that you could buy a home in they didn't show you homes that were not um, available to you loan approval insurance coverage and accessibility to housing often had as much to do with a buyer's skin color and the location of a home as with credit history and job prospects some neighbors knew that and didn't like it. There were uh, those uh, uh, white persons who were willing uh, to aid and assist in uh, opening up neighborhoods. Uh, they would buy the homes in their names and then sell it to, to those uh, blacks that they knew uh, were interested in buying a, a nice home in a comfortable neighborhood. The transition was not without some problems. By the 1960s, despite having achieved many of the same measures of success that Toledo's Poles, Irish, and Germans had, the city's African Americans still found assimilation difficult. They remained in poor neighborhoods long after white neighbors had moved on, and they began to chafe against their limits. 
But across the city, desegregation slowly opened local restaurants and hotels to black customers. Small social victories that papered over the cracks. Toledo has always been such a subtle uh, city where race relations were concerned. Uh, in other words, uh, because blacks were sitting wherever they wanted to in restaurants and on the buses, uh, many blacks were complacent. They felt that they had arrived. And uh, so there wasn't um, a conscious uh, civil rights movement until other sections of the country made them aware that things were not as they should be. In 1967, the civil unrest that racked the country finally erupted in Toledo, on Door Street. Rock throwing and confrontations with police escalated into looting, robbery, and arson. The National Guard came to town to keep the peace, but that was no easy task on Door Street. September 18, 1970, someone shot and killed white police officer William Miss Cannon, who was sitting in his patrol wagon at the corner of Door and Junction. Police arrested a man with ties to the local chapter of the Black Panthers. A short time later, there was a shootout at the Black Panther headquarters on Door Street. When the shooting stopped, two Panthers lay wounded police arrested their leader on weapons charges. Each side blamed the other for the violence, and the city teetered on the brink of disaster. No person was ever convicted of the killing of the police officer, but just the idea that it should happen that was a very negative thing in the life and the history of this community. But it pointed up the extremeness of the feelings and the, and the degree of, of um, separateness and a lack of real hope that we had back then. Th those were difficult days, very difficult days, uh, when you realize that things were happening that we couldn't really control. Uh, and there's something frightening about that when you feel like a community is, is out of control. In the months following the shootings, the Black Panther chapter dissolved and the tension on Door Street dissipated. But the damage was done. The neighborhood would never be the same. A lot of um, violence erupted, and uh, when that happened, the businesses, many of them were destroyed, or the people did not feel safe coming in there. And so, one by one, you know, the area changed. The businesses that stayed saw neglect and recession drain Door Street's remaining vitality. The city earmarked federal urban renewal money to rejuvenate the area and began removing dilapidated buildings. Once the area was raised, crews widened the road to prepare for the arrival of new housing and businesses that would complete the renaissance of Black Toledo. But things didn't work out as planned. Uh, according to the urban renewal plan, uh, homes were bought on Door Street. And of course, people had to be uh, relocated. The businesses were uh, closed down or, or um, they went out of business on Door. So all of the business district uh, from Collingwood to uh, Detroit Avenue were closed out. And parks were built and bike, <laughs> bike trails were built instead. So the heart of Toledo's black downtown disappeared and the neighborhood landscape changed forever. Land intended for new homes and businesses lay vacant, frustrating remaining residents and those who had worked for renewal. Uh, urban renewal which we um, kiddingly called urban removal uh, because there was no renewal. It was just a tearing down of the old without the establishing of the new. 
that's finally beginning to come about now. But even now, it doesn't have a really good plan. If you drive down Door Street, you see a, a fire station and um, several auto parts stores. Uh, no real plan being put in place. It's uh, just growing up again. And, and yet, to me, it's a very meaningful street. When the renewal plan founder, Door Street's remaining black-owned business is closed or relocated. Without easy access to services, many of the community's more affluent residents moved out too. Through the 70s and 80s, Toledo's central city endured some rough times. Over the years, redlining became the exception rather than the rule, and African Americans moved into new neighborhoods and out to the suburbs. But they found that the trade-off for social mobility is a sense of community. It's the same lesson that Toledo's Irish, Germans, and Poles had learned. Since blacks live over, all over, you don't have a black community uh, in which all of the blacks live and do most of the things together as they did 50 years ago. And although we have a close kinship among the people who are black, it's kind of hard to define the black community. Today, though many of Toledo's African Americans live outside the inner city, some remain, willingly, in the old neighborhoods of the black community, fulfilling the responsibility they feel to give others a hand up, just as the previous generations had done for them. I still haven't forgotten um, what this community did for me, and I'm not moving out uh, in some isolated area. Uh, uh, to start a new integration of a neighborhood. This is where I belong. Uh, this is where I feel that I'm needed. If they had been white, theirs could have been the story of Toledo's Irish immigrants, or the Poles, or the Germans. A flight from poverty and oppression a burning desire for opportunity and freedom, toil, worship, and community. But Toledo's black settlers weren't white, and their story is different, every bit as rich and varied, but unfolding still today. Many African Americans have built comfortable lives here, and this city is their home. Others still struggle to claim their place in the community. And for all of them, the trials of their ancestors remain hauntingly near. Reminders of what they've yet to achieve and of how far they've come. I have a, a cotton um, branch that has the cotton um, balls on it that I had framed because there is nothing there is any work harder than picking cotton. And I said, any job I get, when it would get, when I thought it was too rough, I'd put this over my desk, and if I thought that was too rough, I'd look at the cotton bowl, and it wasn't hard at all. It worked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> I don't yeah. ever want to pick cotton again, mm -hmm. ever. Interesting thing about that is that those fingers that once pick cotton, <laughs> Now pick presidents. <laughs> Help support WGTE Public Media and Toledo Stories. To order DVDs of Cornerstones, the African Americans, for $20 each plus shipping and handling, call WGTE Viewer Services at 419-380-4613 or email us at tv at wgte.org. To learn more about this Toledo Stories program and many others, visit us online at wgte.org slash Toledo Stories. View episodes in their entirety and explore additional content and photos for each episode online at wgte.org slash Toledo Stories.